I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. My name's Kim Elson and I am a horticultural educator with the U of I Extension. I'm going to be talking about backyard greenhouse growing tonight. Um, just to begin with, if everybody could please make sure that their microphone is muted. So just make sure that you do have a line through your microphone so we don't have any background noise. So with that said, let's get started. I chose the topic of backyard greenhouse growing just because I think, I mean, it's something everybody can do. It's fun. It's a hobby. It's a wonderful way to be able to get outside when you're itching to get out early in the year. It's a lovely way to be able to still be outside at the end of the year when it's already cold and nasty out. And it's, it's just a nice hobby. And at the same time, you can actually produce quite a bit of whether it's edible produce, whether it's your own blooming plants for the season, or anything else. So with that said, people many times say, well, why build a greenhouse if I have a yard and I can plant in that, and I have a house, maybe I have house plants on my windowsill, why go to all the trouble Especially if I'm just a hobby grower and I just do it for fun, why should I go to the trouble to um, pay for a greenhouse, construct a greenhouse, and maintain a greenhouse? Well, I, my argument is you've got your own little microenvironment. So most of us do not live in the tropics. We don't have the perfect weather. We don't have the luxury of growing all year round outdoors. And a greenhouse is just a wonderful little microenvironment to, to a large extent, I, I can really control the environment I have. I can start growing things early in the season when it's too cold outside otherwise. And not only can I be growing at this time, but I myself can be outside. So it's, it's really a therapeutic thing now. I think most of us that are gardeners, really by the time early spring rolls around and often it's not quite inviting enough to get outside but we really want to we can be outside in our greenhouse so our greenhouse is going to keep out the wind it's going to keep out the cold to a certain extent and it's going to trap the heat in it now when I speak of greenhouses a greenhouse really can be anything under the sun so when we hear greenhouse, we tend to traditionally think you, you picture your little, um, in the olden days, glass greenhouse sitting out in your yard. These days, many of them are plastic. But when I speak of greenhouse, just for the sake of this talk, we're thinking of anything, whether it's a cold frame, whether it's a hot bed, anything at all, anything where you've got that microenvironment that you have some control over, where it's really going to be favorable for you to grow plants in. So as you can imagine, they come in all shapes and all sizes, depending on how much space you have in your garden, depending on how much money you wish to spend on this project, and depending on how much you intend to grow. So usually you want to sit down initially and think, what is my objective? Have I never really done anything like this before, and it's my first time, and chances are I might not do that much with it initially, then start off small. If I'm a very keen gardener and I do this year in, year out, and I've been longing forever to be able to start things early, then really you want to try and get something a little larger. In my experience, your space runs out very, very quickly in a greenhouse. Keeping in mind, we really can't utilize space that well vertically going up. We really have to utilize it more horizontally so that everything still receives light. Now there's a bunch of different materials your greenhouse can come in. I'm just going to touch upon glass, polycarbonate, and polyfilm. And you'll hear a variety of different terms for these as well. Some people call it polyfilm, some people will call it glasshouse plastic, plastic film, or simply poly, anything at all. All three of these have their advantages and disadvantages. Glass is very aesthetic, I think. It looks traditional, very appealing to the eye. It lasts forever unless something happens to fall on it. It's great for letting light in, very durable. Downside is it's very expensive. 
and it's also very heavy, and we'll touch upon that a little later. Polycarbonate, which is what you see in this picture here, is this hard plastic, and those are very popular now. So many times if you go out and you actually purchase one of those greenhouse kits, whether you purchase at a hardware store, at a garden center, whether you buy it online, many, many times it's going to be a version of polycarbonate. It's going to be this hard plastic. It's usually a double-walled hard plastic, and it actually comes in panels. Now, some people, especially traditionalists, think, seem to think, you know, plastic, it can't be the same quality, and I understand where they're coming from, but for the sake of you growing things in your back garden, really plastic will be equally efficient. The nice thing about it is it's very lightweight, so you don't need to have that same structure, that same frame you would need to support the heavy weight of the glass, and it's a lot, more, a lot cheaper than the glass. So those are two very, very good points about polycarbonate. I realize it's not quite as attractive. The polyfilm, which actually comes in rolls, so it's just plastic sheeting, that's really wonderful if I have something that's different shapes, if I have hoops or anything else. Because as you can imagine, if I just have a plastic sheet, I mean, I can just pull it and stretch it over any shape at all, really. My polycarbonate panels will bend to some extent, but I cannot bend them 90 degrees. My polyfilm, I can pull over anything. Very easy, very simple, very user-friendly. I could literally get my little tunnel or my little house covered within no time at all. So that's very easy, and as you can imagine, very inexpensive. If you do do that, just make sure you are actually getting greenhouse polyfilm, so don't try and just get any other version of plastic and thinking you can use it. You really want to have that greenhouse grade polyfilm that's going to be UV treated. Depending on how much you want to spend on it, sometimes it's going to be treated that it's got anti-condensation on it so you don't have the water forming on it. And polyfilm generally will last five years. So you will have to replace it every five years. The polycarbonate, probably 10 to 20 years the glass pretty much indefinitely. So with the polycarbonate and the polyfilm, you'll see they will start to discolor with time. They might turn a little yellowish. They might get brittle as they age. Now, we can have freestanding greenhouses and we can have attached greenhouses. So a freestanding greenhouse, as you can imagine, is simply a greenhouse that's just standing on its own out in the garden. It's also called a standalone greenhouse. The vast majority of greenhouses that you're going to come across are going to be freestanding. The benefits with freestanding greenhouses is I can put it anywhere I want. So that's very nice. I'm not tied to having it by the house. So I can try and choose my best location where I'm going to get the most light exposure, maybe somewhere where I have some wind protection. So my options are open. The downside to it is, as opposed to the attached greenhouse, you do not have that heating benefit, so I don't get that heat coming from my home, so it will be more difficult to heat it. But the vast majority of greenhouses, especially now, are freestanding. In the past, there were more attached greenhouses. So here we can see our attached greenhouse or our lean-to greenhouse. And these were especially in the olden days very popular. It's The wonderful thing is it's attached to your house. I don't have to actually walk out into the garden. As, as I said earlier, we tend to use our greenhouses when it is not friendly or inviting outside. So it's really nice if I have something that's attached to my house, I can just step right into there. That's wonderful. As you can imagine, it's attached to my house. I'm getting that heat benefit. So it's going to be much easier to heat it. The other advantage is I have the structural benefit because I'm building onto the house. So I don't have to have that same frame or that same structural integrity in those three walls because it's leaning onto that house. So that's a, a really a great plus point. Downsides, um, you only have three glass walls. So I have one solid wall, so I'm going to get less light into it. 
And then sometimes, even though it's lovely to step maybe from your lounge or your kitchen into your greenhouse, other times it might not be so practical. So if you can imagine if you're spraying, maybe you're spraying some pesticide, maybe you've just been watering a lot and maybe it's wet in there, maybe it's a little dirty, and you're walking in and out, that could become a problem. So both of these have their ups and their downs. Now cold frames, like I said, people wouldn't necessarily think of this as a greenhouse, but when we're thinking of creating a microenvironment, this too is a microenvironment. So cold frames are wonderful because it's very, very simple. Anybody can construct one. Very easy to fit into your garden. You don't need the same amount of space. It's not going to be the same amount of maintenance. Maybe some of you really don't want to have such a big project. You just want something simple. A cold frame is the way to go. So cold frames, it's just this box, as you can see, and then it has a lid on the top. So usually the lid that sits on, on there is something I can fold back. So the nice thing with those is I can have my lid closed at night time, so I'm going to get that protection at night when it's still cold early in the year. But then I can go ahead and open it up fully in the day, and they can get the benefit of the sunshine and the air circulation in the daytime. So this is great, especially maybe if you had perennials or something in there. Maybe you were propagating, maybe you were growing things. Um, I've had people have bulbs in there. Maybe you want to already have your spring flowering bulbs in pots. But as you know, they tend to freeze if you just have them sitting out. You could have them in your cold frames, cover them in straw, or anything else. So very nice, easy, simple, user-friendly method. Next we have our hoop house, also referred to as a polytunnel, plastic tunnel, anything at all. Again, there's many, many different versions of this. These are very popular right now. You tend to see these a lot, especially in community gardens, in people's backyards. They're very, very simple to construct, very cost efficient, and very effective. So I could have something like this simply sitting on the ground itself, or I could have something like this actually sitting on a raised bed. So here we can see it's actually sitting on a raised bed, so some people would refer to this as a hot bed. And I now have the advantage of a raised bed. I have that wonderful soil sitting in there. It's easier to work in. And I have this nice little environment in there with this roof on there. And this one right here is one of those that I can actually, again, I can fold the entire roof back. So that's wonderful. I can fold it back. I can work in there. Easy to access it. And then I can fold it back again. By having this structure over the top, I'm going to keep the humidity in there. With the condensation that keeps dripping down, I really have to do extremely little watering, if any at all, when it's cold out. It's much warmer in there, you know, it's trapping the sunlight in there. So this is wonderful, especially if I want to start my veggies early or if I want to keep them going later in the year. So this is later in the year. We've got cold crop veggies here. It's already too cold outside for them to still be growing, but it's just warm enough inside the structure. And you could have this in any size of variation. So you could have a hoop house in your garden that would be large enough for you to walk in and out of it. Now, many times when we see these plastic houses, people are actually growing in the ground directly. So as opposed to a greenhouse where we're thinking of having a benching system and you're having your pots or your flats sitting on that bench, in plastic houses, many times we're actually direct growing in the ground. So once you've decided upon what type of unit you want, the next thing is to think about how you want to lay out that space within your greenhouse. So it's really, really important to sit down and start to think, what are your priorities? How am I going to lay out that space? Now me being a grower, my number one priority is always going to be I want the maximum amount of space for plants. I don't want to be storing all my tools in there. I don't want to be storing my wheelbarrow and everything under the sun in that greenhouse. So it's very, very precious space, especially if maybe some of you might be heating it, you might be lighting it. Now it's expensive space as well. You really don't want to be wasting that on tools or anything else. Yes, you still want to have a few necessities there, so you have everything on hand. 
I like to keep my soil in there to make sure that it's not frozen. I want to keep my pots in there, my flats in there, anything else that I'm actually growing in, maybe my plant labels, my seeds, you know, simple things. But I don't want to start accumulating everything that should actually be sitting in my tool shed or in my garage. So just keep that in mind. Now I put these two pictures in here just to show you. I've come across it many times that people have one of these racks that you can see in the middle here. And this is what we call a display rack. And many people will think this is a way of being able to utilize their space better by having plants stacked above each other. I would really recommend against this practice simply because a display rack is only meant to be there for plants to sit on it temporarily and not long term. Once they sit on that for a longer period, you'll see the, the layers on the bottom, they're not going to get enough light, they're going to start to stretch, they're going to start to grow outwards to try and reach for that light, they're going to get thin, they're going to lose some of that foliage. Every time you water, it's going to rain on them, so the bottom row is going to sit really wet. Now they might get diseases, there's not going to be much air movement down there, so it's really not a good practice. Now if you had something like this wooden shelving unit, it's a different story because you can see it's actually going up at an angle. So they aren't technically above each other, they're not going to cancel out light, and they're not going to be raining from one down to the next. So just keep that in mind. Now I just did a very, very simple little drawing here. Nine times out of ten, your greenhouse is a rectangle. So as you walk in on the bottom in the middle here, that's your door. So that's a very lost space already. I can't do anything there. Now, like I said, my priority is plants. So I want to have as much bench space as I possibly can. And some of you might not have benches. Maybe you have it on the ground. I like to have it on benches just because it's much nicer to work on. So I've got benches pretty much all the way down and at the end across. Now, as you step on on your left, I have what we call a potting bench. Now, a potting bench is the area where you're going to do all your work. It's where you're going to do your potting up, your seeding, your transplanting, anything and everything. It's really the most used space, so I really like to invest a little bit in the potting bench. Get something nice. If you know somebody crafty, have one made. Otherwise, you might have to purchase it. I like to have them out of wood. And the nice thing with the potting bench is I can always have some soil lying there. I can always have bits and pieces. That's what it's designated as. I don't have to worry about it or tidy everything up every time I come and go. Now, underneath my, my potting bench, this is where I can store some of my materials. So I could store my flats or my pots under there. I could store my soil under there. The only reason I don't like to store things generally under my plant benches is simply because every time I water those benches, I'm going to have that water running through, and I'm going to have that running onto all my materials. Now, the water in itself might not be a problem, but as you know, usually when you water more and as things grow, you tend to wash a little soil out of those pots. So now I'm going to get soil and water on whatever's sitting underneath there. So that will not happen under that potting bench. So use that as your storage space underneath. Now, the only reason I didn't have my potting bench at the far end of the greenhouse in the middle is because that's where I have my extraction fan. So that's where I've actually got the air being sucked out of there. And I really don't want to have my potting bench and everything stacked up on there because I don't want to interfere with that air movement. So this is just a very, very simple design. So you can think of whether this would work for you or anything else, but just try and sketch something out. Now, in terms of benching systems, on the right here, you can see a black plastic bench. That, personally, is my favorite, just because I can cut it to shape. I can cut it in, and so it can fit into any size I have. Very easy to work with. It doesn't have sharp edges. Really important with every bench, I want to have that grid system. I do not want to have a solid bench. I don't want the water sitting in there. I don't want any soil sitting in there because that will be a place for bugs to live in. Now, depending on what you've chosen for your greenhouse, whether you have glass or plastic or anything else, it's going to determine the foundation that it will be required. 
So remember, if I have glass, it's very heavy. I'm going to need a solid frame. And it's going to be a much larger project than if I have one of those plastic houses. The other problem with glass is if I have to put down foundations now, I've got to go several feet down. You've got to be a little careful. Sometimes you need a building permit, and now you have to pay taxes on it. So that's really something we want to avoid. If I have one of those plastic houses, that hard plastic, that polycarbonate, that eliminates all of that. You can see it on this top picture, I just have a very simple wooden frame that's set into the ground, easy peasy. Then I'm going to take some rods, and I'm going to knock those straight into the ground. That's all I need, nothing else. Now, you could also have the Cadillac version, as I like to call it, on the bottom here. We've got hard landscaping. We've got a brick path in the middle. We've got gravel. This is the deluxe version. By all means, if you have the means to do this, absolutely. But you do not need anything as fancy as this. Just need that wooden frame down there. What I like to do then is actually put down weed fabric, landscape weed fabric, and then put gravel on the top. Now again, it's going to be entirely up to you. How wide do you want that walkway to be in the middle? How much bench space do you want to have? Some people might not need that much bench space, but they want it to be comfortable to work in. They want to be able to turn easily. They'll have a more narrow path. So this is just to show the two opposites, the contrast. On your left, we see one of our typical ready-built greenhouses that you pick up, one of your kits, very easy to construct, very user-friendly, very simple to put up. I don't have to start thinking about where my vents or my doors or my this or that goes. It's already designed for me. On the right, this was actually a project where they were trying to use recycled materials. They had a very, very small space to work in. And so this is very much an individualistic greenhouse. So just to show you the two contrasts between them. Now you do see there's a pathway, a hard landscaped pathway leading to this greenhouse. That's always a great thing to consider. Keeping in mind, usually when I'm heading back and forth to this greenhouse, it's cold out, it's wet out, so it might be muddy. So it's really nice if I can have a decent pathway leading out to it. Now, when you're choosing your site, there's several things to consider. Number one, I want to try and get the maximum amount of light into that greenhouse. Remember, you generally are not going to be growing in summer. You're going to be growing early in the year. You're going to be growing late in the year. So you really want to make sure you're getting the maximum amount of light. So try and have it lengthwise from east to west, so you're getting the maximum sunlight in there throughout the day. It has to be somewhere that is absolutely level. So if you do not have an area that's level in your garden, you will have to level an area out. Now, you do also need decent drainage under your greenhouse. Keeping in mind, most of us are not going to have a fancy concrete fall in that greenhouse. You probably just have some landscape fabric and some gravel over it. Now, I always like to remind people, Try not to just put down the fabric and put a few, one or two inches of gravel over the top because most people have solid clay. And if you water quite a bit in that greenhouse, I found that it'll literally the water will just sit there as it has nowhere to go. So it's a great practice to actually dig down deeper and backfill it a little bit with gravel so that water can actually drain away a bit and it won't sit there. Try and have it somewhere in the garden where it's accessible. You really want to make it as user-friendly as possible so that you do actually make use of it. If it's cold and miserable out and you've got to trek across the garden, you might not end up doing it. So just keep that in mind. Obviously, aesthetics is also something we want to consider. You might have your perfect spot smack in the middle of your lawn. Chances are that's not where you want your greenhouse. Most people want it off to the side a little bit. They want it tucked away a bit. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. As long as you're still getting sufficient light, I would then say try and make sure you have that north side up against any border you have so you can try and cut out that north wind. It'll help with heating your greenhouse. Next, you want to think about how intense am I going to actually run this greenhouse? Do I want electricity out there? Do I want natural gas out there? 
So electricity would be to run lighting if you wanted to have that, maybe to run fans, maybe to have an electric heater. Natural gas would be to heat. Now yes, in the long run, if I use gas, it is cheaper to run, but you really want to consider that cost of laying that line, whether it's worth it. So most people usually will not even use electric or gas at all. Usually for a small hobby greenhouse, we're just going to rely on the outside elements. And then don't forget water. So you might have a hose point out there. It's really not necessary to have one in the greenhouse because keeping in mind it will be frozen anyhow in the winter and then you're going to have to flush it out. Some people have no hose at all there. You know, they're just going to fill water, watering cans, go back and forth. Some of them might have a barrel directly outside the greenhouse. Some will have one inside the greenhouse. But just consider it. Now once you're up and running, just a few things to be aware of so that you grow a successful crop. We have four critical elements in our greenhouse. Lighting, temperature, air movement, and humidity. The only one I'm not going to really go into any depth is humidity, and that's simply because many times it's unnecessary to do anything towards this. In summer, generally, you have sufficient humidity as it is. Early and late in the year, you're often watering your crops all the time. You should have sufficient. If you wanted to, you could run a humidifier. Many times it's not necessary. So lighting, as you can imagine, if you want to grow plants, light is one of your most critical elements. So early in the year and late in the year, we're trying to get as much light in there as we possibly can, like I said. Ironically, once we actually get into mid-spring, late spring, it heats up in there very, very quickly. So if I do not have electrics in there, so I don't have fans in there, whether it's simply an oscillating fan, whether it's an extraction fan, if I don't have any of this, you know, it's going to be difficult for me to cool this greenhouse. So then maybe I want to cut out the amount of light that's coming into my greenhouse. And there's a variety of different methods to do this. Whatever works best for you. A very simple method is to actually apply whitewash. Whitewash is simply like a paint. You mix it up. Um, you could rent a machine and spray it on. People with small houses can just take cups of it and throw it on. Very, very simple to apply. What it's going to do is a lot of the light that hits that greenhouse is going to be reflected back so you don't have as much sunlight entering the greenhouse. So it will keep it a lot cooler. In the fall, when you do want to get more light back into that greenhouse, you can simply brush it off. It comes off very, very easily. Another thing you could do is actually to apply a shade cloth. So here in the picture you can see they have a shade cloth on there. It's a netted cloth. It's usually black. It's going to cut out a lot of the light that's entering there. So depending on what you're growing, one method might work better for you than others. And depending on your structure, what's easier to do. Now for supplemental lighting, again consider do I have electrics out there or not. If I don't, I don't even have to think about it. If I do, again, what is it I'm growing? Is it necessary or not? So many, many hobby greenhouses will not have any form of lighting in it at all. If you've been doing it a long time and you're growing specific things and you realize it's not working, then by all means start experimenting. Usually I just tell people start off simple, start off easy, just have a grow fluorescent bulb. You really don't need to get anything expensive anything expensive like high intensity lighting or invest in something like LED which is initially more expensive to purchase but might be cheaper to run. Really I don't think any of that's necessary. Also think to yourself if you need lighting which means now it's either extremely early or late in the year or maybe even winter, generally I need heat to accompany that as well. So again is this something you really want to invest in? Temperature. When we're thinking of temperature, try and think of both day temperature and night temperature. If I do not have any electrics or anything else in there, the only way I can control temperature is to open vents and doors and, like I said, to apply that shade cloth. 
Now, how can I open my vents if I don't have anything electric and I don't want to run outside a hundred times a day as the sun comes and goes? You can get automatic vent openers that do not require any form of power. So most of those run on mineral wax, some on beeswax. They actually do have a metal cylinder in there and a piston in there. As they warm up, that wax expands. They push that vent open. As they cool down, they'll contract and they'll close that vent again. I think these are God's gift because I can have them on roof vents, on side vents. I can have them on louvers. And now I do not have to keep worrying all day in spring, you know, when the sun's coming and going, and as soon as it comes out for a little bit, it just cooks in that greenhouse. So that's a really, really nice user-friendly option. Now, the only reason I said be aware of day and night temps is because depending on what you're growing, just be aware. When I have warmer temperatures in the day and cooler at night, I'm going to be pushing my growth. If I want to hold my plants back so that I get that really nice, sturdy, strong growth with thick stems and they grow slowly and they put on a lot more roots instead of shooting up, then I almost want to have the same temperature day and night. So I want to try and hold them back. So maybe just get a thermometer or something, put it in there, and just keep a record of your temperatures just so you have a basic idea. Air movement. Air movement is critical. Many people don't think of air movement. It happens naturally outside. We bring our plants inside, and it's not just the light that they miss. It, they desperately miss that air movement. Walk into a greenhouse, you know, nine times out of ten, you'll hear fans running. They're forever moving that air. Not only is this going to mix your cold and your hot air, because your cold's going to sink down, your warm air is going to rise, but at the same time, it's going to make your plants stronger and healthier. It's going to make sure they're less susceptible to disease. Things are going to dry out quicker. It's just overall much, much better for them. So if there's one thing you are going to invest in, I wouldn't even look towards the lights. I would really look towards making sure you get some form of air movement in there. And it might not always be possible to open those vents. You might have the sun coming out, and it might still the temperatures outside might simply be too cold. You don't want to open those vents and have that cold air flood in there and sink straight down onto your plants. So you're better off having some fans to move that air around. I always tell people, just try and be a little careful. Don't point that fan directly at your plants. You don't want to blast them. You don't want to stress them. Try and aim it so it's just imminently above your plants. So what do you actually want to grow? Really try and choose things that are going to be rewarding. They're going to grow fast. They grow readily from seed. They come true to type. It's something that I can start off, and once it's mature, I can move it out. So things that really are going to work well. I like to have fast crops because if I have something that's very slow, it's going to be taking up space in my greenhouse and just sitting there for an awful length of time. If I grew something like a tuberous begonia, or maybe I even grew geraniums, or anything at all like that that's very slow, I'm, wait I'm losing that space in my greenhouse for an extremely long period of time, and I can't grow anything else. Vegetables are absolutely wonderful. Herbs are wonderful. Um, many of my annual plants that can be grown from seed will grow rapidly. So just keep that in mind. Some things do not grow as well from seed as other plants do. So some plants really are much better in quality when they're grown from cuttings. And with, with something like that, you, you're better off simply maybe purchasing them or taking cuttings if you have some plants at home. Like I have a geranium on here for you to look at. The left is a seed one. I never like seed geraniums as much as cutting-grown geraniums like the one on the right. So something like this, you'd be better off propagating it from cuttings. So keep that in mind, which plants grow well from seed. If I have hybrids, if I have F1 hybrids like my tomatoes, just keep in mind, I don't want to be harvesting my own seed and growing that. I want to be purchasing that seed. And then, can I actually go out and buy it? So as a home grower, we're really limited to what can I find in my garden center seed-wise. 
or have I perhaps collected, or maybe something that I can search for on the internet. Most of us are simply going to buy it at that garden center. So we don't have the luxury of purchasing plugs, of getting anything like that, or rooted cuttings. So I'm going to be limited to what's available. And then try and a little bit try and group your plants in terms of having similar needs. So predominantly temperature. Try and grow things that like the same temperature. And I'm not speaking, you know, specific temperatures, just general temperatures. If something wants to be grown cool and the other thing warm, really they're not going to be very compatible. And in such a small greenhouse, I can't have separate zones. I'm better off trying to choose things with similar needs. If I really want to grow a variety of things and I cannot do that, I'd find a great sort of average temperature would be anywhere between 58 and 62. Again, it's going to be hard to regulate this when I don't have all those automated controls, but I can aim for it. Now my limiting factors, number one is always going to be space. Like I said, I find that that space, even when you think you have so much space, it fills up instantly. So be a little cautious, don't start too much seed, you know, because you could have a full flat of seed, you could have 500, 1,000 seedlings in there. Once it's time to actually pot them up, you might not have space for that many pots. Even if you're using small two-inch pots, it's still a lot of space. And then once they get a little bigger, maybe you can't put it out yet, you want to start actually spacing those pots, checkerboarding those pots, you would need twice as much space. So just keep that in mind. And here's a picture to show you what I've been trying to recommend you do not do, stacking plants on top of each other in shelving units. Another limiting factor is simply slow crops, like I said. Try and avoid those. We don't want to have something that's going to take six months to grow. Staffing, in other words, am I going to be there every day? Am I going to go out to my greenhouse? Am I going to open the door, open the vents? Am I going to water things? So you really want to be checking on that greenhouse regularly. And I don't want it to sound like it's a chore, but keeping in mind things grow rapidly, seeds germinate rapidly, things can dry out really, really quickly in that greenhouse. When things are in their plants are in a seedling stage, they're really, really susceptible. So I really want to be going in there every day and checking on things. If I know I'm not going to be there all weekend, it's going to be hot, try and have somebody else go by there. You'll be amazed how quickly you could lose everything in that greenhouse. Next is heat. That could be a limiting factor if I do not have any power source out there. Really, I'm just relying on the sun to heat that greenhouse. Now, there are different methods to get around that, and again, it's going to depend on how keen you are. I've seen people have those black 55-gallon um, drums in there filled with sun, um, I'm sorry, filled with water. So as the sun comes in, it hits those, it actually warms those up, and then at night, it's going to be giving off that heat. Um, some people will have actually their compost unit within that greenhouse because that compost heap will give off heat as it's ex actively composting. So there's all sorts of different things you can do, but again, it depends how involved you're going to get in this. Then we have light. Light is a limiting factor. If the sun doesn't shine and I don't have supplemental lighting, there's very little I can do. So the best thing to get around that is to try and grow crops very early in the year that don't need as much light. So generally your cold crops, your cold veggie crops won't need as much sunlight as your warm loving crops later on. So when I'm starting things, nine times out of ten I'm going to be using seed. So yes, I could be dividing some of my plants or propagating some of my plants, but generally I'm going to be using seed. So just a few basics, keep in mind when you are sowing that seed, like I said, there's no need to use that whole seed packet. Many times I don't need everything that's in there. I might not want to have 150 watermelon plants. There's nowhere to put them. So be a little cautious. Don't sow it all. When you do sow them, you can decide do you want to initially sow them in a seed flat and then transplant them, or do you want to sow them directly into that pot so you don't have to do anything else to them. I like to start off many times in a seed flat because I like to potter about in that greenhouse and have something to do out there. The other nice thing with the seed flat is then I can actually sit it on my heating mat 
and it'll germinate readily and I can have a variety of different seeds in there and then just transplant them subsequently. So make sure you have a seeding mix so it doesn't have any fertilizer in it. It's a nice fine mix. If there are any clumps in there, break it up. Have it really nice and level. Take a ruler or an empty flat, anything at all. Level, level it off perfectly. And then go ahead and water it prior to sowing your seed. Really, really important to have a watering head on the end of that hose that's got a fine, fine spray in it, so I'm not washing that soil around. Make sure it's not got any dirt or anything in it so you don't have any water divots in there. Water it thoroughly and then go ahead and sow that seed. And I say this because if you don't water it ahead of time, you sow the seed, you cover it with soil, and then you water it. You've got to water it thoroughly to wet that soil. And then I have a much bigger chance of washing that seed around, especially fine seed. So if I can water it first, then put my seed on, A, it sticks to it nicely, it doesn't move around anymore, and I don't have to water it as much once I sprinkle the soil over the top. Be sure not to bury your seed. So if I have real fine seed, I literally just need a fine coating of soil over the top. I don't have to layer on an inch or two of soil. And then try to spread it out nicely. So you really want to have a nice gentle movement of your hand. Just keep going back and forth. If it's a real fine seed and you have a hard time, maybe your hand's a little shaky, try and mix it with something. Mix it with sand or anything else. A great way to make sure that you do not get problems with plants stretching on you, with plants having bug problems, with having not enough space in your greenhouse, is to schedule when you want to start those seeds. So when I say schedule, you really want to work out when do you want to have that plant ready. So when can you plant it out? Is it something that's tender? So then I want to really make sure when is my last possible frost date. And even that doesn't always work exactly, as I learned this year. I want to think, is it something hardy? So can it go out earlier? Pick my date and then work back from that date. And this isn't as difficult as it sounds. Look on the back of your seed packet. It's going to tell you a lot of information. It's going to tell you how long that seed will take to germinate under a given temperature. It's going to tell you how long it's going to take to maturity. So I can pick my date when I want that plant to be ready, and then I'm going to work back from that date. If I do not do that and I simply go out and I sow them, and next thing they grow, I have lovely weather, then I have all these plants ready to go and I cannot put them outside, it's too cold. This is when they might start to stretch, especially if I don't have enough space to space them out. Maybe it's still too warm in that greenhouse. They're going to get tall. They're going to get leggy. So really try and schedule everything so it won't be ready too early. Like I said, you could do several seeds in a seed flat. Just make sure that you label each row so you don't forget what it is once it starts to come up. Keeping in mind that those seed flats are really shallow, so you really want to be on top of things. And if you see your seedlings are in there and you think, oh, I should pot those up, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, that's really not something you want to wait too long. They don't have much space to root into. Once they're in there a little bit too long, now they start to intergrow with their roots, so it's going to be more difficult to disentangle them. If they stay in there too long, often it's going to stunt their growth. They're going to dry out really, really quickly. So you really want to have that perfect window when they're not too small to actually handle, but they haven't yet gotten to that stage that they're intergrowing with the seedlings around them. Some things you might have sown a whole seed flat, and you might simply want to thin them out. So you might not want all of them. And you think, oh my gosh, I have far too many in here. Just go ahead and thin them out, throw the rest away. Like I said, you may, many times have far too many seed than you actually need. Now when you do transplant your seeds, just keeping in mind good planting practices, I really want to make sure that that seedling gets transplanted so that it's going to be at the exact same level that it was originally. Meaning I don't want to plant it too deep because I'm going to suffocate that stem. I don't want to plant it too high because it's going to be stressed as well. Firm it in nicely, water it in, and do it in a quick, swift sort of transaction. Have everything laid out, my soil, my pots, everything filled. 
don't pull out my seedlings, leave them lying there, and then start doing everything else. Because keeping in mind, if you're working in your greenhouse, maybe it's later in the day, it's sunny, it's hot out, things are going to wilt quickly. Another way to get around that would be to work early in the morning. Now, people do often get problems with dampening off. My advice for that would be simply keep your seedlings on the dry side, make sure you've got that air moving throughout there, and make sure they're warm enough. So even though I generally always advocate to people that they should grow their plants on the cool side because they grow much sturdier, much healthier, much slower, they're generally less susceptible to pests and diseases, there's a difference between my seedling and my more mature plant. The more mature that plant gets, the cooler temperatures it can take and the better it is for it as a general rule, not for everything. But as a seed and as a seedling, most things want it to be warm. So keep that in mind. You really want to still try and give them that warmth when they're young. Many times dampening off will also happen if you've done everything right. You see that those seedlings, maybe your basil seedlings, they dry. You think to yourself, okay, I'm going to go ahead and water those. But now I have an five days after that where it's cool out, it's cloudy out. So if you know you're going to get that weather coming along, resist the urge to water them as long as they're not drooping. Ignore them because during all that cold, cloudy weather, they really don't need that water at all. And they're just going to sit wet now for the next five days. So as long as they're not actually drooping, wait until that cold, cloudy period is over and then water them before the sunny period starts again so they won't sit damp for so long. Maintenance, just general, check on them. That's your number one thing. Pretty much for everything in the greenhouse, I think the most important thing is simply to be there. Be there, check on things, be aware of what's going on. When you're there frequently and you work with them frequently, you're going to spot things instantly if something doesn't look quite right, something doesn't look healthy or happy. Um, just walk out there early in the morning with a cup of tea. It's nice to potter about, check things, what needs to be potted up, what needs to be watered, know what's going on. Nice thing about checking things all the time as well is that now I'm also going to be aware if I get any form of bug problem because I'm going to spot it early on. Best way to treat something is to spot it at those very, very early stages. When you do water, just keep in mind good watering practices. Nine times out of ten, it's around the edges of that flat that things get dry, not in the middle. That usually sits wet. Don't blast things, you know, you really want to make sure that you water from the top down, don't water that at an angle, don't use too much pressure. I like to make sure early in the year that I'm actually not using water out of the hose because many times it's ice cold. So I just have a drum or something else sitting in that greenhouse that I fill with water and that way the temperature can rise a little bit and I'm not going to shock those plants every time that I go ahead and water them. In regards to pests and diseases, like I said, scout. Simply walk around, always be looking at things. Sometimes you won't see the bugs. Sometimes you'll just see that the, the growth looks distorted or maybe it looks stunted. Maybe it's just been sitting there and not doing anything for a while. Check the undersides of the leaves. Um, you could also have yellow sticky traps in there. That way at least you'd be aware if you have any flying insects in there. But just always check things all the time so you can catch things early. Really keeping in mind you're starting off with a perfectly clean, sterile greenhouse, so it's going to be up to you to keep it that way. The nice thing generally with hobby greenhouses is that we don't grow things over the winter time. I can let it go completely cold and I can freeze everything off. So that's really a blessing. That means every spring I start off with a clean slate. The best, best method to making sure that I don't have pests and diseases is prevention. So I really don't want to wait till I get something and then just plan on spraying it. It shouldn't be necessary. Try and practice prevention. The best way to practice prevention, have healthy plants. So healthy, healthy plants are going to be a lot less likely to catch bugs and diseases. How do I keep my plants healthy? Good watering practices. 
water consistently. Do deep waterings when you water, but then let things dry out thoroughly in between. Have good water. Don't use ice cold water. Don't shock them. Try and make sure you have that air movement in there. Try and make sure that things are spaced out nicely. Make sure your plants are never stressed. Try and provide them with what they need temperature-wise. So just the very basics. The healthier your plant is, the less likely it'll be to catch anything. Don't water your plants late in the evening. You don't want things sitting wet all evening. So just basic practices. And try and keep that greenhouse really clean. And that's another reason I don't like to actually sit things under my planting benches. I want to have that ground clear under there so that I can sweep it out all the time. So every time I spill soil or wash soil out, I can sweep it all up. Good husbandry is the key to making sure you don't get those bugs as well. You don't even want them to have those spaces to hide in. So in terms of cultural, like I said, prevention. In terms of physical, very simple in a little greenhouse. I mean, something like aphids, I can literally just go and hand squish them. I could just take the hose and try and wash them off a little bit. So that's the nice thing with a small greenhouse. It's much easier to control these things. If I just have one badly infected plant, I can discard it. In terms of biological, some people will ask about what they can bring into that greenhouse. And usually if you go to a garden center, there's very little that they'll sell. They might have ladybird bugs, they might have nematodes, and they might have praying mantis. That's usually the three things they commonly have in your garden center. Now in terms of ladybugs, just keep in mind, many times by the time they actually start selling those in your garden center, it is a little warmer out. So you're probably going to have the vents open in your greenhouse. So even if you do have aphids, they might stay, they might not. So just keep that in mind. In terms of chemical, try and avoid it if you possibly can. Like I say, the nice thing is on a small scale, many times I can actually avoid it if I can catch things early enough. And that's why it's key to be in and there all the time. Keep working with those plants. So just a few more basics to finish up with with growing. Um, some plants, when you grow them, you'll actually want to pinch them out. So many, many different plants, I actually want to pinch out the tip of that plant, that active growing point, so that that plant's going to be forced to branch out, and I'm going to get a much nicer habit. I'm going to get much more branching. I won't have those big distances between the leaves. I'm going to do that with endless different things. I'm going to do it with my petunia, with my verbena. I'm going to do it with my nemesia. I'm going to do it with my chrysanthemums, my poinsettias. Endless, endless different plants. So keep that in mind, because sometimes you might think, why is my plant, I feel like I'm doing everything right, and it's still a little long and leggy. It's really not the way I want it to be. Read up on it. Maybe it's something that should be pinched out. In terms of fertilizing, again, just be a little aware of what you're growing. Some plants need a lot of fertilizer. Some actually don't like any at all, virtually. Um, some plants might want acidic fertilizer. So again, just read up on things. And these are just sort of bonuses now. You know, you can grow plants just fine without these things. But if you really want to have those top, top-notch, beautiful plants, this is where you can grow the extra mile and start to read up on things like that. Keeping in mind, when you do move things in outside, yes, they have been receiving all that light in there and the air movement, but it's still a very different environment to moving it outdoors. So just be a little aware of that. So when you move things outside, I just like to give them a day or two of transitionary period. I'll sit them somewhere where they may be sort of part shaded so they can get used to it for a day or two. Don't sit them straight out in the sun and maybe then forget about them for a day and they dry out and they wilt. Just sort of acclimatize them gently, only a day or two. So just to sum up, generally I feel many times with hobby greenhouses you're going to be predominantly making use of them in the spring and in the autumn. In the summertime, sadly, usually generally it's too hot. And in the winter, it's too cold. Unless I'm going to be heating that greenhouse, which can become a really expensive 
procedure, keeping in mind with the polyfilm, you know, commercial greenhouses actually have two layers of polyfilm. They blow air in between, so they have that nice insulation. That's something we don't tend to do. We just have the single layer. So usually I actually recommend, recommend with polyfilm to remove it over winter so that it doesn't buckle under the weight of that snow. With um, our plastic, again, it's not going to keep that heat in well, so that's a really expensive procedure. And then again, you know, how easy is it even to reach that greenhouse with all that snow? So winter is not very practical. And summer, yes, maybe if I have sufficient shade cloth, but then I have to be growing shade plants in there. So again, it's very limited. So generally, as a hobby grower, we tend to use things to be able to start things early and to keep things growing late. So it's pretty much a season extender. And with that said, that brings me to the end of it. So I hope that's given you a general idea of different materials that are available, different styles of greenhouses, some considerations, what to think of in terms of your critical elements within that greenhouse, your lighting, your temperature, your air movement, um, what plants do I actually want to be growing in it, how do I want to lay that greenhouse out. I would recommend it, I think it's a really rewarding experience, once you have one, it's hard to stay out of it. With that said, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, if you don't think of them right now, but you come up with something later, whether it's now or whether it's once you start actually growing, my contact details are on the screen, so please feel free to get in touch with me. I'll do my best to answer it. Keeping in mind that all our webinars are going to be on YouTube, so it'll probably take, I'm guessing, maybe a week. So if you wanted to go back to it or refer to something, you can go ahead and watch those on YouTube. Otherwise, I'll say thank you very much for tuning in this evening, this beautiful, warm evening. I do see someone typing, so I'll just wait one minute. I have a small hobby greenhouse and purchased a milk house heater and a thermo cube to keep the temperature in the greenhouse just about freezing, but are there any guidelines that I should have been following? Any guidelines that I should have been following in terms of what, in terms of what temperature to keep it at? Oh, you just guessed on the heater? You know, and I'm, I'll tell you quite openly, I'm by no means an expert on heating. Anytime, any heating that I've used in commercial greenhouses is already is blowing hot air, so it's on site. I haven't have to do anything to it. Myself, personally, in my greenhouse that I have in my garden, I actually have electric heat. So it's a little more costly, but it's, it's easy to do. It actually comes on automatically once it drops below a certain temperature. I have never used a milk house heater myself. I don't know if any of the other educators that are on, if they have any good ideas for you. It's a small electric heater. Okay, so with your electric heater, um, to me, just the most important things to keep in mind Make sure wherever you have it that it's not pointing at anything. Very easy to burn your plants. Um, I have mine actually switched on with a sensor, so once it drops below a certain degree, it'll just come on for a little while and then turn off again. Anytime I'm using it, I always want to make sure that I actually have my air moving at the same time, so it's really mixing that air nicely. I actually have mine closer to the ground because that warm air is going to rise up anyhow. So then I also try and make sure that that air movement's moving in the ground as well. Other than that, nothing that I can think of. Pleasure.
With that said, if there's nothing else, have a lovely evening. Thank you for tuning in.